minorities or rather um, religion minorities and migration in ancient Greece and I'll be looking at the island of Delos which you can see highlighted here on the map um, and well why Delos um, so Delos is an island of the Cycladic group in Greece and we'll be focusing tonight on the time period of 166 to 88 BCE and this is a particularly interesting time period um, because in that time span um, the island had become a free port which means a lot of migration a lot of sort of through traffic from traders from all over the world. Um, it is also known as the island of Apollo because supposedly Apollo was born on Delos which meant that Delos had a very important Pan-Hellenic sanctuary of um, Apollo, so people would come there to worship the god and come to festivals on Delos. Um, it is seen as the center of the Cycladic islands, which were building a ring around a cycle around um, a Delos, which was its um, sacred center. And um, what happened is that a lot of the goods that were shipped from the Levant to um, the west, that is to Rome, in this time period, we're actually going via Delos. Um, so it's in a strategically great position and um, was incredibly important as a crossroads um, for people from all over the Mediterranean. Um, what I'm going to focus on tonight is um, the sanctuaries of the so-called foreign gods. And you can see here on the image um, the map of Delos and the sanctuaries that we're going to look at. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse when I move it? Uh, yes. So we are going to focus mainly on this area here, these sanctuaries here, and then mm -hmm. this mountain here. You can see the sanctuaries up here on the photo. You can see Mykonos in the background. We are not going to go party on Mykonos tonight. We're staying on Delos. <laughs> and then up here, this hill, which is Mount Kynthos, the sacred mount of the island. So this is basically the area we're going to look into. Um, as the name suggests, these sanctuaries were not of Greek deities. So we're not going to leave Apollo and all of this aside tonight, but focusing on those who are coming in in that time period. Um, so here is a closer snapshot of those sanctuaries. On the right hand side here, we have the sanctuary of the Egyptian gods. And then next to it, you can hardly recognize it, but you can maybe you can see a mold in here. This is a theater or used to be a theater. And this is part of the sanctuary of the Syrian gods. And then if you see here, the temple that you can see in this image as well here, the temple of the Egyptian goddess Isis, and you can follow up where these people go up here to Mount Kynthos, which also saw an assemblage of lots of different sanctuaries of interesting gods that we're going to look into. Now let's start with the sanctuary of the Syrian gods. Um, so here's a map of the sanctuary, a layout of the sanctuary, and you can see the uh, theatre that I was talking about. And this is an important um, part of the sanctuary because not only um, were um, sacred plays performed here, but also this sanctuary, uh, this uh, theatre was dedicated to the goddess by the worshippers themselves. So they put together a fund to pay for it, to erect it. The sanctuary was founded by priests from Hierapolis in Syria in the second century BCE. And um, on the left-hand side here, you can see an image of um, a mask, um, a little mask that was found in a house on Delos, which probably um, represents one of those um, priests from Syria. You can see the um, pointed hat. And on the right hand side here, you can see an image from Hierapolis in Syria, which actually shows that canonical hat that is typical for these Syrian priests. So these priests came to Delos and founded that sanctuary. And it was dedicated to um, two gods, Atagartes, which is a female major deity, a Syrian um, deity, and her companion Hadad. Um, so what we know about the sanctuary is that as I said, it was founded by Syrians themselves, but then soon was taken over by Athenians. But the Athenians who took over the sanctuary as priests uh, from the Syrian priests um, in the first generation, um, 
did keep certain um, Syrian rituals alive and so on and so forth. So it's not like it completely changed into something Greek in that moment. Um, but who were those worshippers which call themselves there are poetai, so those serving the gods. Um, as I said, we have a subscription list of worshippers who dedicated the theater. You can see the excavation photo here on the right hand side of that sanctuary of the Syrian gods. Um, and if you look at who went to the sanctuary and who actually um, made it happen, then you can see that we have everything mixed together. We have on the one hand side, Philostratus of Ascalon, so he's from Ashkelon, which is um, modern um, Israel. Um, we have a Roman woman. She affords 50 drachmae, Licinia Lucio. We, we are missing her first name in the inscription. She also gives 50 drachmae to the um, uh, fund for the theatre. We have an Athenian who, with his brother um, and his mother, gives money. His children are also uh, listed here. And then we have um, Zoila and Asia, two slaves or freed women of someone called Isidorus. Um, and then we have also the daughter of a Romaios of a Roman man, a Quintus Placius, which is a, a family that we find quite a, um, quite, um, a lot of um, on Delos. Um, so basically, we also have another slave, probably a slave, um, who appears in the list just before Licinia Lucio. The reason why I point this out to you is there are many more other um, dedicators here, but I just wanted to show you how diverse the range of people were who were worshipping at the sanctuary of the Syrian gods here. So it's not like the Syrian set it up for themselves, but really this is a cult that is open to everyone and everybody is taking part and um, dedicating here. We also have two Marthas, and Martha is of course uh, a name that has a Semitic background. We don't really know where they were from, but it's likely that they were from a Levantine background. Um, so overall then we have Athenians, yes, but we also have Romaioi. These are the people that we call, um, they call themselves Romaioi before Rome is a really big power. Um, we have Phoenicians here, we have um, citizens of Delos, we have slaves, children, and women and men. So it's quite a mixed bunch of people who all come together here to worship these gods. Um, what happens at the sanctuary? Well, what we see is that there's ritual dining happening, for instance. We have seen the theater, so there were ritual performances, but also, as you can see on this um, relief here, which shows a banqueting scene with a male um, reclining and drinking, um, and a female um, playing the lyre and a servant attending. So this is something that is very likely happening here. And you can also see where we have these rooms here that are scattered around the sanctuary. Um, which were equipped with these brick benches on which you could recline and dine. Um, they were suitable for around seven or eight people, so you can imagine that altogether it might have been a group of 50 people or so that were dining there in smaller groups. There's water supply that was provided, and we have the exedras. Um, this is what these rooms were called, um, um, that were also attached to spare rooms where uh, food could be prepared, kitchens, basically. What's interesting is that we find a very similar makeup in sanctuaries from Palmyra and Eurupus. So this is clearly the Eastern influence here on this sanctuary that is taken and brought to Greece. However, the, the bench height is clearly Greek. So it's really a mixture of both um, traditions here that comes together in the sanctuary, which is actually really quite nice to see. Um, and these groups, that were dining together are called Marzia groups in the um, Levant, and they were um, sort of religious associations that were meeting for the purposes of ritual dining. So we find the same thing here. This is probably what inspired the groups on Delos. I'm just going to show you one particular example, um, the Exedra of Midras, so that you get an idea of what these rooms looked like. So here, for instance, we have one that was um, um, with a beautiful um, mosaic. Um, so these are not simple rooms, but you can really see that these were really nice dining rooms. And the guy, Midas, who dedicated this is a well-known uh, individual on Delos. He um, is uh, Italian, an Italian. He had um, citizenship in Heraclea Lucania, but 
we believe that he was actually originally from the Levant and then he took on citizenship in um, Heraclea. So very interesting background story here, someone um, from the Levant coming into Delos, then moving on to, to um, Italy and still having that connection to um, Delos. So he had then become a citizen of an Italian city. And this is not the only case. We know another case where that happened. Um, but you can see how sort of, yeah, almost cosmopolitan um, this the, the island was at this point already. Um, the next sanctuary that I wanted to look at is the sanctuary of the Egyptian deities, Isis, Serapis, and Anubis, because they were also present on Delos. Um, and here I think it's... Um, really um important to to um see that these um gods were while they were sort of egyptian they were also at this point quite greek in many ways you can see on the left hand side a ptolemaic egypt uh, uh, an isis from ptolemaic egypt which dates a little bit earlier in the fourth at, at the end of the fourth century um, and then you have serapis who's her consort um probably a greek um in, well, not invention, but a Greek development. And then Anubis, who um, you probably all know, um, who helps with the mummification process in Egypt. And those three were worshipped together on Delos. They are even called the Delian Triad um, because they appear together in the inscriptions. Um, so the sanctuaries of, of those Egyptian gods were next to the sanctuary of the Syrian gods. And the biggest one is Serapea on C here, and they're called Serapea, even though Isis is really the deity that is worshipped most here. So here's Serapea on C, Serapea on B is here, and Serapea on A. So we have three sanctuaries to these deities, and they were in fact the wealthiest sanctuaries next to the Apollo sanctuary, which is the main sanctuary of the island. So clearly these cults were um, really going very well here um, as well. Um, so the interesting thing is that we don't really know very much about who who founded all of those, but for Sarah Perrin A, we know that it was founded by a priest from Memphis. And we learn about that um, because um, he tells us about it in an inscription. And this is the inscription. It's a um, column which is based in the Serapeon that you can see here on the left-hand side. And you can see the inscribed column on the right-hand side. And here he claims um, the right to the building. He says, actually, um, my grandfather um, was a priest who came from Memphis in Egypt and he built, uh, he brought the cult with him, the cult statue, and my father inherited the office of priest and then I inherited it. And then there's a lot of um, praise for the gods uh, and so on and so forth. But you can see that he's really claiming originality. He says, we are the oldest one here. So there is already competition between those three sanctuaries of the Egyptian gods on Delos because um, everybody sees an opportunity as well here. To, um, to, to to set up a cult because it's so popular. So um, here you can see that what may once have been a small cult quickly explodes and becomes a really, really big um, fashionable thing. Um, and here um, on the right hand side, you can see the temple of the goddess Isis, um, which is still standing as it is here in the picture on the island. And this was um, dedicated by the Athenians to Isis, and it's in the biggest of the three sanctuaries, Serapeon Sea. Um, and you can see, if you look at it, it doesn't really look particularly Egyptian. It could be any old Greek temple. Um, so you, can, you see what I mean when I say there is definitely an Egyptian element here, but um, it's not as obvious. So if we look at this sanctuary, the, the largest one, the Serapeon Sea, um, we can see that um, we have courts, a, a courtyard here, um, which leads up to the temple. We have um, a, a sacred lake here, which is quite Egyptian as well. We have a temple of Serapis and Isis. Um, and um, the courts were often um, shaped as these white peristyle courts, and they, they were like, those of Egyptian temples because the ceremony was about showing as well about the procession. Um, so that's quite different from Greece then. Um, they tend to have the temples, as you can see here, pushed to the side or to the back. 
they are not really at the center. If you imagine the Parthenon or so in Athens, which is at the center of the Acropolis, this is not the case here. So the courtyard is really at the center. The temples are rather pushed to the side. Um, the um, temples are also front facing. You've seen that in the image that I showed you earlier, whereas a Greek temple usually would be a temple that you would go around. So the Parthenon has images all around and it doesn't matter from which side you look at it. Um, and it's possible that, or we, we think that maybe these these porticos, so these uh, halls um, in the courtyard, were used to to um, as stages or so to perform um, or carry out ritual acts by the priests. Okay, I know I'm being really I'm rushing through this, but there's so much to say and I don't have so little time. So let's move on. If we climb up that mountain that I showed you earlier, the Mount Kinthos, um, there is a sort of cluster of smaller sanctuaries. They are simply called E, K, L, M, N, and more, um, because there are so many of them. You can see some of them here. So here you can see um, sanctuary K, N, E, um, and these are um, sanctuaries that were built in the same style. They are simple open courtyard sanctuaries that we um, associate with the oriental style. It's probably not the right word, but um, it's a specific style of sanctuary. Um, you can see it here. It's basically just like one dining room, and they were um, with a hearth in the middle where you could prepare a sacrifice or a food. Um, and these are actually interesting because they were all dedicated by different people. So it's 13 of them in total, and there are these open courtyard sanctuaries with a hearth. Um, and we can only identify a few of the deities that were worshipped here by the inscriptions <clears throat> that were found in the sanctuary. Um, but they seem to be dedicated or erected by individuals <clears throat> who have come to Delos from their hometowns. So they will be worshiping deities that they brought with them from their hometowns. Um, and for us, if we're interested in religion, there's um, some, uh, you know, uh, there are some specific regulations, which we call sacred norms, um, which tell you that these gods or the, 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 the sanctuaries um, forbid the sacrifice of goats. Um, this might be due to a Phoenician um, influence or perhaps because these are from a Phoenician um, background. So we have um, a dedication to the gods of Yamnia. Um, and a dedication to the um, heavenly Astarte Aphrodite. And these both forbid the um, sacrifice of goats, which is for a Greek sanctuary unusual. So the reason why they put these regulations here, the people, is because this is something that is not normal for Greek religion. So in a Greek sanctuary, you would be able to uh, sacrifice a goat. Not here, though. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a couple of those sanctuaries, or else I'm going to be sitting here forever. But um, let's focus on number 107, which you can see in the map here. And this is a sanctuary of the gods of Ascalon, um, again, which is in modern Israel. Um, and this was erected by a person called Philostratus um, of Ascalon. He's a banker on Delos. So he has a bank business on Delos. And he is friends with Midas that we have met before. Midas, the guy who dedicated the beautiful dining hall. Um, and he too has citizenship in Delos, but also in Naples. So he's dual citizenship, basically. And we learn that through the inscriptions that he sets up. Um, he dedicates the sanctuary to Poseidon of Ascalon. So this is a local Poseidon of the city of Ascalon that is sort of translated into Greek here as Poseidon. Um, he also dedicates um, an offering to Palestinian Astarte. And this is done by his wife and children. These inscriptions all date around 100 BCE. So this is a time period for most of these sanctuaries on the hill here. Um, sanctuaries B and C are also quite interesting. Um, here we have a dedication to the first gods. We don't know who these first gods are. They are called the Theoi Protoi. Um, and this inscription also mentions a table, uh, tables and kitchen in the kitchen where probably they prepared the sacrificial meat that they would then uh, eat together with the gods and the worshippers. And then we have another dedication that we don't really understand. Um, it's um, 
dedicated by a woman called Patrophila, and she's from Sidon in um, Phoenicia, and she dedicates this probably to the deity Anat, um, a Semitic deity. Now, one more sanctuary of those very interesting ones, and this is Sanctuary L, which you can see here um, circled in on the photo. This is um, dedicated to Heracles and Harona, the gods who are possessing Yamnia, which again is a city in, in modern Israel. Um, so you can see to an extent, these um, offerings are made to gods that are being translated into Greek. Well, Heracles obviously is, is a Greek um, god. It would probably be Melkart in Phoenician. Um, and Harona, which is a local bot god that cannot be translated as easily. And here too, as you can see, you may offer everything except something of the goat. So the goat, again, is forbidden as a sacrificial victim. Um, right, apart from that, we also have what people call the earliest synagogue um, that was found outside of um, Israel. So this is the first... Um, um, diaspora synagogue. This is sort of slightly removed from the rest of the island, uh, if you wish. It's on this part of the island here. This is the area that we're looking at. You can see the image here. The synagogue is down here next to the sea. Um, the sanctuaries that we looked at before are all in this area. So this is a bit further away, although I'm saying that it's probably something like five to 700 meters. It's not very far away because the island is quite small. Um, so this is in the area of the stadium. You can see the stadium running along those houses here and then down here is the synagogue. It's an area that is really not um, at the center. So the center of the city would be here and um, the harbour would be here, although um, new excavations are showing that there might have been a second harbour here as well. And so it's also an interesting, but a relatively newly developed area. Um, so this is an image from inside the so-called synagogue. Um, and the reason why, um, oh yeah, here you can see, sorry, a map of it was again, what we see seems to be a dining room in A and B, so these are equipped with benches, so people could probably assemble here, meet and dine together. Um, and this room, so the whole building has been done up several times. I think there are six or seven building phases, but um, the first of the, or oh, six, here we go. Uh, the first of the um, building phase dates um, from before 88 BC, that's what we know, and this is the time period that we can deal with. Um, now, the problem is, of course, um, the interpretation of the building as a as the earliest diaspora synagogue in the Greek world, and this is relying on the inscriptions that were found in here. Now, the inscriptions that were found there are actually dedications to a god that is called the highest, so Theos Hypsistos, the highest god. This is the word that is used in Greek to translate Yahweh, the Jewish God. So this is how the interpretation came about, that this is um, probably by a Jewish people. So um, the first dedication is by Lysimachos, who dedicates this to Theosipsistos. We have a dedication by a woman called Laodike, who also thanks Theosipsistos, who has saved her from death with healing powers. And then we have um, a dedication by a person called Zosas. He's uh, from the island of Paros. He also dedicates something to Theosipsistos. And then we have Markia, maybe a Roman woman who also dedicates something to Theosipsistos. So we have a group, it seems here, of worshippers of Theosipsistos um, who may well be Yahweh. So it's very likely that there is, there has been um, um, of an early synagogue, if we want to call it that. Um, another group that we find here is sort of related to this, and this is a group of Samaritans. Um, and they, um, we have two inscriptions of this group. They were found not in the synagogue, but 92.5 meters north of it. And these, um, people identify as the Israelites of Delos who make contributions to sacred Garizim. So Garizim is the mountain um, that is dedicated to the God of the Samaritans. So they are also a Jewish people 
who were a different group from the Jews of um, Jerusalem at this point in time. So again, a very interesting group here. Um, and if you look at the inscription, you can see that um, it's actually dedicated by someone called Jason from Knossos. Knossos is in Crete. Um, so he himself doesn't identify, at least officially in this inscription, not as, a, as an Israelite. Um, so we don't know whether he might once have been one and has changed his name or taken on a different citizenship or whether he's just interested in their worship and joins them in their worship. But we do know that the group exists here on Delos. Um, so um, I don't know. How are we doing for time? Um, absolutely fine. We're sort of we're halfway through. If you want to carry on and or attempt to do more things, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Okay. Then I would um I would I think I would take the opportunity to talk you through um what that means for the individual and the lived religion on Delos. So I've shown you a wealth of sanctuaries just to give you an impression of what was going on in terms of choice of cult. Um here you have a view again of the city center with the temple of Apollo at the center and the sacred lake and several other temples. So this is the major sanctuary of the island. Um, our um, foreign gods are located here. And then we have the synagogue up here just for orientation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through the dedications of one individual, and this is a Roman man called Spurius Statinius. And Spurius um, uh, Statinius, who was the son of Spurius, um, uh. he um, actually, um, we know where he lived and we know a little bit of what he did. So he lived in the very city center. I, I um, marked it here with a star. He lived in a four shop front house and he, that's really the prime location. It's very likely that he was a businessman. The house looks quite fancy that he lived in. Here you can see it in a reconstructed plan. So this is where the house would have been. And here you can see number 12, the, the, the sanctuary of um, Apollo with a major temple in it. And this is what it looks like today. Um, here you can see the um, ruins of the, of the house. <laughs> um, so um, it's really... He's really at the at the heart of the island of the, of the of the city. Um, so how did we identify the house? Well, archaeologists found a household shrine to Artemis Sotera, so the, the Artemis the savior, and this is the dedication by Spurius to this Artemis in his house. This is how we um, how it was identified as such. You can see the inscription in the wall of the house. This is a very Roman thing to do to have these. Um, uh, household religious shrines so um that's quite nice to see that as well so the roman habits um coming here to delos and then there's a second dedication to this very artemis artemis sotera artemis the um savior also by spurious um it was found in the so-called temple of sebastian so it's um not far from the house but not in the house either here you can see the dedication on the left hand side and artemis sotera holding two torches um so artemis sotera is interesting because um she is the patron deity of the seafaring community so that's how scholars have um established that this guy might have been into business um and um all the dedications that were made to her here were private. So there isn't an official cult of her either. So this is something that happens among the people. It's mostly Italians on Delos who worship her and he chose to worship her as well in his house and elsewhere. But not only that, he also um, dedicated um, to the nymphs of the Minoe fountain. You can see the Minoe fountain on the left-hand side and um, above you can see the relief that he dedicated to them. Um, so the dedication here too is by Spurius Titinius and he's dedicating it to the nymphs of the Minoe fountain. And this is the only one of its kind. Now, if you think about reasons for doing that, he lived very close to this fountain and it's probably the fountain where he would go to get water. Water is incredibly important on Delos because it's a very dry island, as you can imagine. Nowadays, it has to be um, support, um, supplied um, by, by boats with water because it doesn't produce enough water. So in the ancient world, it might have been slightly different, but not much different. And considering how many people lived there, 
Um, whereas nowadays it's just the archaeologists uh, who live there. <laughs> um, this is a really crucial everyday life um, uh, supply, uh, basically, this farm. So no wonder that he dedicated something to these very local um, nymphs. Um, but he didn't only dedicate to them, he also dedicated to the Charites. So these are the healing deities. So here he dedicated a round marble altar that was found near the Agora of Theophrastus, not far from his house either. And um, he thanks them for being healed by them. Um, and it goes on. We have him dedicating also at Serapion Sea. We've talked about that already. So this is a big sanctuary to the Egyptian gods. And here um, he um, dedicates um, to Hydraeus, the god Hydraeus, probably the god Hydraeus, who listened. Um, and he gives a thanks offering. Um, and another inscription tells us that he also dedicates um, a thanks offering to uh, Serapis, Isis, and Hermanubis Nikephoros. This is also quite interesting because Hermanubis is a combination of Hermes, the gods, uh, and Anubis. Hermes often associated with um, trade and with merchants. And Nikephoros is the one who carries victory. So what seems to have happened here is on the one hand side, um, he was successful in something. That's why he is dedicating this to the to the to the victory carrying Hermanubis, probably in a business deal or transaction. Um, <clears throat> and Hydraeus who listened, so he must have had um, an appeal to the gods for or asked the god for something, and the god had done that for that for him. If you if you think back to the Hieritis, that was a very similar dedication because he thanked them for um, having healed him. The dedication before was to the to the fountain, where again the fountain probably supplies him with water. So what we can see here is this individual who is incredibly um, involved in these local, well, divine entities, but also um, going to the sanctuary of the Egyptian gods, which are sort of much more global in many ways, because these are not local; they are not from from um, from Delos, they've come in and yet they help him in a very personal way, if that makes sense, through these dedications. Um, and he also um, dedicated to a subscription list in which worshippers um, put together money to build the Hydraeon, the sanctuary of Hydraeus. And here he appears with his wife and his children. So he's also investing in the cult on the island. And this Hydraeon is again in the sanctuary of Serap uh, Serapis uh, or the, the Sarapeon Sea, the big sanctuary that we saw at the very beginning of um, my talk. Um, and then lastly, he probably also dedicated to Apollo, which is quite funny because obviously Apollo is just opposite of his house. And we are not entirely sure, but he might have given um, a dedication to him as well. So he's really doing the whole round and just making sure that everyone um, and every deity gets a little bit of attention. Um, yeah, so I think to sum up, I think what we can see on Delos is that um, this is really a place in the second century where a lot of religions come together. There's a wide array of religions that is present here that ranges really from monotheistic cults uh, to well, very specifically Egyptian cults, very local cults, gods that come from one town, one city in in the Levant, in Phoenicia, and they then are being brought here to Delos and worshipped by those who have maybe moved here. So it's a completely open um, religious environment. And if we look at the individual worshippers, they really come from everywhere as well. So it's not like only the Egyptians worship the Egyptian gods. On the contrary, there are lots of Romans and others in the sanctuary to be found. Um, and some of those cults, as we shall see later over the centuries, are incredibly successful. For example, Isis, one of the most, um, yeah, the, the longest actually, one of the longest lasting pagan deities in, in, in Egypt, for instance, and elsewhere also in Rome. So in the very late antique inscriptions, we still find Isis, but of course also the Jews will be 
very successful. Um, and others probably only survived a generation or two. So some of those cults that we've seen on the mountain, these small sanctuaries that were brought there by individuals um, who moved there, they probably died out after a generation or two. Um, and at the latest when the island of Delos was um, devastated in 88. So I think it really is, in a way, a snapshot of what was going on in a place, in a multicultural place in the ancient world um, in terms of religion. Um, yeah, and that's, that's that for me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Steinhardt. Well, that was really fascinating to kind of see the diversity really of different cults, even in one sort of particular island within the Hellenistic world. That's, yeah, absolutely fascinating to see. Um, I suppose the first thing that I'd like to ask you about is the process by which perhaps people who weren't from the particular areas got involved in those particular cults. So perhaps how Athenians got interested in Syrian cults, how the cult of ISIS got so popular. What was the sort of process of people perhaps, you know, getting to worship gods which perhaps they didn't grow up with or perhaps weren't around, you know, sort of from the beginning? Well, of course, you go for the million dollar question first. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. If, if only we knew. Well, it's. I think it's It's a little bit, um, well, some, some things we can explain. For instance, ISIS at that point is already well known to the Greeks. So there was a sanctuary of ISIS in Athens in the fourth century already. So she's not an unknown deity. Herodotus, the, the famous historian, writes about ISIS and likens her to Demeter. So he says, well, ISIS is like Demeter. So the Greeks know ISIS, whereas they probably don't know a local god from somewhere in Phoenicia. So that might be, um, say, an advantage for, for ISIS that she's already well known. And she also changed shape. So the ISIS I showed you with the with the with the very Egyptian looking um hair and um headdress. This is not the ISIS that you will find in Greece. She looks very Greek and she has sort of yeah, all the Greek um attributes that you'd imagine. But um the other thing is that um compared to other Greek gods, ISIS offers a lot. So she sort of um as, uh, assumes lots of powers from other gods as well. She can do anything. And this is what makes her so powerful and why people like her. So whatever you have, you can always go to Isis. I see she's just sort of just this useful one-stop shop for anything you need, like healing, exactly. crops, anything like that. Absolutely. So seafaring, healing, fertility, childbirth, marriage, um, yeah, you name it, I initiations. Um, <laughs> yeah. So she has a long list of attributes that go with her. So she's really uh, quite powerful like that and quite interesting. And and she's sort of exotic enough, but not too exotic, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So it's it, more interesting than your old Athena right, that you've grown up with. And... <laughs> Absolutely. I can imagine that, you know, it's sort of, she's just sort of interesting enough that, you know, people can, you know, find her really intriguing. She's not too sort of, out there that it's that people consider it beyond the pale of reach and i think as you identified that the fact that she had such a broad reach i imagine gave her probably a very broad and diverse cult um and probably a lot of utility because if you can go to one god i expect it's probably better than making lots of dedications um am i right to say that or am i just yeah no, ab here? no absolutely i mean um I think the, the case of Spurious, what I tried to show here as well, is that you can make your own religious landscape, if you wish. So for everything you, so some of these dedications were never made on Delos to, to any of these divine entities. And he just does it because he feels like it or because there's an opportunity or, or a case where he thinks he needs to do it. Um, but then I think these, if you are on an island like Delos, where there are a lot of people from elsewhere and you have a deity like Isis that brings them together because she's also not from there, that's actually quite, um, you know, makes sense if that, you know, like in terms of um, thinking about expat communities or so, which then come together elsewhere. Absolutely. And I suppose, would it be too much of a guess to say that these could almost perhaps be really good focal points of perhaps different communities who have perhaps come in from different parts of the world and perhaps wanted a kind of common touch point, you know, to kind of get together and perhaps, you know, have something that you know was from home and things like that. 
Yeah, for some of them, absolutely. Yeah, that's at least that's the initial idea. I think what then happens though is that they really, I mean, um, become something new in in the local circumstances. If that makes sense. So initially, it might be yeah. Egypt, but then it becomes very Delian. This is a Delian sanctuary. It's only there, nowhere else. It, it's made like that by those different people who come here. Um, whereas the initial idea, yes, yeah, you could see, for instance, with the smaller sanctuaries especially it's to have that connection to home but maybe that will then get lost especially after a couple of generations absolutely absolutely another thing that really interested me as well is almost the topography of where um, a lot of these foreign gods were so the fact that they're on quite a big hill just kind of off of the city center um do you think there's anything deliberate about that in the way that they are all kind of clustered into one place well, they definitely don't have a spot next to the traditional sanctuaries, that's for sure. Um, mm. Although there is one very old sanctuary to Zeus on, on that mountain as well. Zeus often was mm. associated with mountains. Um, but um, it's probably also because um, of space, simply. You know, you've seen the Rocky Mountain and it's probably an area where you wouldn't necessarily want to build. So these people could build there because it wasn't great. So that might have been another reason why they were so sort of push to the side a little bit here. Ah, oh, nice, I see. Mm. And I suppose that does surprise me in some way, because I always, I guess this is perhaps major in showing, but I always imagine mountains sort of being places with the sort of physical presence over the rest of the islands. And I wonder, like, would that have had any impact at all, the fact that you had a lot of cults that weren't perhaps sort of indigenous to Delos, but were kind of on this higher point overlooking the city, having this kind of place of problems, or was it just that they were just kind of put to one side away from the kind of heart of the city center well i think both both are, are sort of um true in many ways because um a lot of cults were associated with mountains especially in the levant um as you've seen the the the, the samaritans they are f fixed and um on on the um on mount garrison for instance so that is very clearly there connection to god so there's definitely that there is a reason for that as well why they are on that hill and overlooking it that's absolutely true i was just thinking about the fact that the old sanctuaries and the old town is sort of so far away but definitely it's always a prime location for sanctuaries to be on a mountain absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely that's really fascinating to kind of see how you can always interpret it both ways so it yes. can almost be kind of you know put to one side you know it's fine but just do it over there but also how it can take on that divine significance of kind of being in an elevated place i think that's really fascinating yeah i mean like i think it's also about the representation oh, i mean what do they represent so if you look at the major sanctuaries this is also a little bit showy offy right so people coming in and seeing the great sanctuary of apollo and all of this whereas by the time they are up the mountain and see these yeah, okay, sanctuaries there, right? <laughs> you know, that, that that stuff, you know, it's it's a different sort of message, I think, being sent there. So they serve different purposes, I'd say. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> That's really fascinating. Um, and I suppose on another topic as well, um, what was the, I suppose this is quite a broad question, um, what were the general benefits that one sort of hopes to have by making a dedication and by, you know, quite publicly inscribing that onto one of the pillars and walls of the temple so um it's a really good question so there's i think two sides to the coin on the one hand side we have people like spurious who really seems to be quite religious yeah who does these dedications which are really small rather and, and not really you know show your fee i'd say but then others and quite a few people especially on the agora and around the sanctuary of apollo on delos have done these amazing porticos and put their name on it and said for the god but actually what they're saying is look at me i've done this so there there are these two sides there's always um that element whereby you um use this as a little bit of yeah you know helping yourself to some uh, free um yeah um what we how, how can i say um without being mean but you know it it definitely is something that we see quite often that these um, propaganda materials are being used by individuals. I mean, later in Rome, you you'll see it much more often that this is something that you would do as a as a general. So you set up a temple in your name, but this is sort of a going there, and especially 
the Italians on Delos um, have done that a lot, that they have actually put up massive inscriptions and, and massive dedications to the gods, but that would then be mostly in the city center. And this is the interesting thing. So this is where you would want to be seen. This is where you want your name to be um, visible. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the smaller sanctuaries up the hill, you know, yeah, if you really believe and want to sort of go to that deity, but it's not for, for showy off your purposes, I don't think, um, to go there. Absolutely. I suppose you have to almost go out your way to go up to somewhere like that. So yes, yeah. exactly. That's it. Making the effort to actually go there rather than just being in the center anyway. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I suppose another thing that sort of would intrigue me about this is that I, the impression I suppose that one gets from this is of a fairly tolerant and sort of multifaceted religious environment. But do you think there was ever any tensions between different cults? Um, and if so, what form would that take? Um, well, I think in this case, because the way it worked in terms of authorities, what we can see is that, as I said, so initially the Syrians set this cult up, but the Athenians will be in charge by that time um, because they are in charge of the island. They will take over the priesthoods and control it. Um, it doesn't happen with all the sanctuaries, but with most with the bigger ones. So there is definitely that um, um, uh, trend and that uh, political sort of um, direction that you would want to um, not only... Um, influence the sanctuary, but really um, steer them. And there's several reasons for that. One of them is that they really are banks as well. So a lot of the dedications made to the gods are really valuable. And we have the inventories from Delos for the sanctuary of Apollo and the sanctuary of um, the Egyptian gods. So we know how much they possessed and they were very wealthy. Um, and that is something that you want to get your hands on as well, of course, as, as a civic institution. So, um, <laughs> Tolerant, if it works out, definitely. Um, but more in the sense that, how can I say this? So in a polytheistic society, it doesn't really matter, right? Because mm -hmm. Isis is the same as Demeter somehow. You know, they are alike. So there isn't really an issue here. There are as many god as you, gods as you want, and they are sort of all similar and all, you know, it isn't really yeah. an issue. So um, it's more about how powerful are they in terms of, uh, how much can they make how much money how, how many people do they attract and at some point then the authorities will clamp down on it in the sense that they will take over and do the same thing but on their own terms mm -hmm. so it means there's less of a kind of question of like sort of what people believed and much more sort of the resources that it could provide and yeah i could imagine necessarily perhaps a wealthy individual or perhaps a civic body you know how much income they could get from having those endowments and things like that. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, these um, uh, temples also were, uh, functioned as banks, so you could borrow money from mm. them and have to pay it back. Um, and, you know, the small groups such as those of the Jews and the Samaritans on the other side of the island, for instance, um, they are not really important because not much happens there. But you can see from the inscription that people who are not necessarily from that background are still interested in that religion and they still engage here. And this isn't an issue at all. From a from a sort of theological perspective, that doesn't mean any, you know it doesn't mean anything. They don't have an issue with that. It just works together at that point because this is of course all before Christianity comes in. Then it's a different issue. Absolutely. Then there's more of a kind of question of what's the correct form of practice, what's the correct God and the correct form of God to worship, and all of that wonderful business. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, but it's true. I think that's true. So. Mm -hmm. Um, someone like Spurious, I mean, like he's really trying to cover everything just to be sure, hmm. you know, you don't, you never know. I mean, the, the, the Greeks were most confused about their own gods. They, they asked the Oracle the most often, which God should I pray for? Because they don't really know who to address for what business, you know? Hmm. So there's, this is something that they're themselves confused about. So you better um, cover all your bases and go to as many gods as possible uh, <laughs> just to make sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we can definitely see that through the way that Spurious sort of makes so many different dedications. And I suppose sort of just as you said there, like it's covering all your bases and just making sure that, you know, you're appeasing as many different sources of divine power as you possibly can. Yeah. 
Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, moving on. Um, another thing that kind of interested me is the fact that a lot of the inscriptions um, obviously are in Greek and sort of seem to transliterate, in fact, not even transliterate, but actually sort of give Greek names to non-Greek deities. And I'm quite intrigued by that. Is there a sort of a reason why everything is kind of in that Greek format? Or do we get examples of perhaps um, non-Greek inscriptions as well? Yes, we do, actually. So there are some inscriptions um, which are in um, Aramaic um, and for some of the words that we don't even have in, uh, translations. Um, so it does happen. Um, but obviously, if you move to a mostly Greek speaking world, then you want to try to explain yourself in a way that the people there understand it. So we have a few bilingual inscriptions, uh, Phoenician and Greek, for instance, and the the Greek version it's not really a direct translation, but it's an interpretation of of what was said in the original language. Um, but I think the, the aim seems to be for most of those people. So they would come there and often they would take a Greek name when they arrive. So, for instance, the priest who would set up the um, Sarapeon, you know, I showed you the column there. He is called Apollonius. Or his grandfather was already called Apollonius, but an Egyptian would probably not be called Apollonius. So this will have been a trans, you know, he would have chosen the name when he came there. So what we see sometimes is that they have two names, also known as, and then comes perhaps the original name. And this is, of course, an issue for us if we want to try to trace where these people came from, because often they just appear with their Greek name because it's preferable in those circumstances to be Greek in that moment. Um, but we'd really like to know where they're from. So we'd really like to hear their original name. Absolutely. And I think, obviously, it's such a shame that that can get lost sometimes when, you know, they perhaps take on a Greek name to kind of assimilate better. But Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's something that you can also see, I don't know, um, for example, in America, where um, people will anglicize their names when they arrive or, or used to when they arrived there, um, when they migrated there, so that they didn't sound too out there or that or people could simply not pronounce their name so then you would take a name that works mm -hmm. in the language um so yeah and and for the gods i mean it's it really is um is interesting how easy it seems to be for 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 the ancient world to simply translate those gods but they are not exactly the same. That's, of course, not true. So Demeter is not Isis. Isis is a different goddess, and everybody knows this. And yet, you can say she's like her, and everybody's happy with it. That's quite a fascinating concept. I think we can't really get our head around um, how that works. Absolutely. I can see what you mean, because I thought, for example, with, you know, calling a god, for example, Poseidon of mm. Delos. I can imagine it would be some sort of sea god. And obviously, you know, there's some connection between, say one form of sea god and another, but of course they would both have unique sort of things about them. With Poseidon, it would be the horses, the tridents, the earthquakes, and I think it's really fascinating how, I think as you said, you know, sort of from what we can see, people could kind of approximate different deities, but, you know, obviously they were distinctly different, but, you know, they sort of found a way to make it fit. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's sort of a sort of polytheistic language that they speak in which they can communicate the, these deities. And in, in principle, what you would do is you would go to a new place and you would worship the deities there. Mm -hmm. And you would sort of find a way to explain to yourself who they are. So Astarte, for instance, the Syrian goddess, is associated with Aphrodite. So she is the Syrian Aphrodite. This is how she is translated or the Palestinian Aphrodite. So this is basically an Aphrodite, but a slightly different one from there. But there are lots of things that she has in common with Aphrodite, so let's just say it's an Aphrodite, yeah. and then it works. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's a sort of a way to kind of put it into a form that makes it accessible and easy to understand for someone who perhaps is not quite used to the kind of rituals and concepts and theology of the place that they've travelled to, I suppose. Yeah, or it simply doesn't matter as much. Because, you know, in the end, they, they, they will have similar powers. And, you know, you need to address the correct God in this time and this place. So, you know, you just go with it. Um, you just try to make it a bit more intelligible, I suppose. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, one thing which um, quite interested me, just from our sort of recent conversation, is sort of how you said, you know, it would be fantastic if you get to know more about people, you know, and their origins and things like that. 
And I'd like to pull that out into a question, which is, um, and I expect there are probably quite a few of these, but um, what do you think of the sort of big blind spots right now in kind of studying the religious scenes in Delos? What sort of things do you think would be really great to know? Like, if only we had a bit more evidence and things like that. Wow. <laughs> well, where <laughs> should I start? <laughs> um, I think Delos is actually a relatively well-equipped place. So we are quite, that's why I used it actually tonight because it has so much to give us. But but what we really don't know is whether this is the norm or the exception because Delos was mm -hmm. um, basically devastated in 88 um, uh, BCE and then completely abandoned in 66 BCE. And then, well, maybe a few people lived there, but it never was um not like Rome or so that was always inhabited. So it was basically left alone. So we have a fantastic um, archaeological situation here where everything is still there as it was basically, not entirely as it was, but relatively speaking. So the question is, is this an exception or is it the norm? And mm -hmm. this is the big question that we always ask, um, um, you know, ourselves, um, because we don't have anywhere really where we have a similar situation where we have the same types of evidence and the same image appearing. I mean, we do know that uh, many Greek cities were quite cosmopolitan quite early on and had lots of different cults that we do know, but not in as much detail as here. And for instance, these small sanctuaries that we have, that I've showed you on the, on the mountain, it's just coincidence that we still see them because in any other context, they would have been gone. They would have been built over or forgotten, you know, and here we still have them as they are. So that's quite unique, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's certainly very fortunate. And I think, as you say, it could be really, it would be fantastic if we could perhaps learn a bit more about the broader situation, because it could be the case that, you know, just being this kind of focal point of, you know, Levantine trade and things like that could have afforded it that degree of plurality, or it could have just been the norm. I suppose it's the sort of thing where we would need more archaeology, more kind of sites, hopefully, yes. to be excavated and things like that, to be able yeah. to yeah. I see. And I suppose, oh, sorry. No, no, it was just, I mean, the other thing that, um, obviously, ancient history, the problem that ancient history has is the fact that the sources are so select. So it's just a particular type of source that we have quite a bit of, that is the historiographical texts from a particular time period all focusing on Athens so we know quite a bit actually quite a lot about Athens but not very much else so if we want to talk about a city that is not Athens we really have to start from scratch quite often that is by looking at the epigraphy mostly at the inscriptions and the archaeology because we have no literary sources to tell us about those cities um, and that is quite a challenge I think so we have a very Athenocentric view on the ancient world because most of what we know is from Athens and it doesn't apply everywhere. So as you can imagine, the world's quite diverse already then. Absolutely. And I suppose it must be quite challenging to draw the line between, you know, is this something that we can establish as, you know, a fact about the region or is yeah. it just that we're seeing a particular trend? Is this just the evidence surviving that's perhaps skewing the way that we're actually seeing the world? Absolutely. This is this is one of the biggest issues I think that we have, that we have to really be careful of not falling in that trap that we think this is the norm when actually we have maybe five examples or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And are there any ways to reconcile that? Or is it just a case of just saying, you know, we found this, it could suggest this, but in truth, we're not too sure. Well, I mean, the, 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 the best way to do it really is to compare and to look at other places. Really, that's the only thing you can do. Find find comparative material. And if you don't find it, then just assume that it might be an exception. Um, but yeah, so for instance, with, with, the, with the Delos case, um, uh, a few years ago, um, a new inscription was found in Thessaly. And that was a massive, is, is a massive inscription, a very long inscription about the mysteries to Assyrian goddess. The inscription is really intriguing because it gives us a very detailed account of the festivals and the, the celebrations and the things that you had to do for the initiation, the mysteries of the goddess and so on and so forth. And everyone was like, well, we did not expect this at all. So then everybody was surprised that it existed. But if we assumed that Delos is the norm, then we wouldn't be surprised, if that makes sense. 
Absolutely. So, you know, these things still pop up and there's still a lot to be discovered and discussed. Yeah. So surprised with this, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, well, I'm sorry to say that sort of brings us to the end of our hour. It's an absolute pity. I think there's so many more different avenues that we could explore yeah. this particular area. But unfortunately, um, we have come to the end of our session tonight. Um, it's been a great pleasure to be joined this evening by Dr. Julietta Steinhauer of University College London, a lecturer in Hellenistic history, a research associate at the Institute of Classical Studies in London, Women in Research Fellow and researcher by taking the project Localism and Religion in Ancient Greek and Senior Developer of the A-Level in Classical Civilization at OCR. Steinhauer, thank you so much for your time this evening. It's been a really fascinating discussion to get to know more about the religious world in Delos. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for watching and hope you'll join us in our next episode. Thank, thank you, you so much, much for care. having me. Yeah, brilliant. It was really good fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good See evening. See you soon.